great. In your uh, younger years, you studied uh, art, is that right? Yes, I did. When uh, did you think your focus started to turn around towards music? Well, uh, when I was a child, a very, very young child, I'm talking four and five years old, I was already interested in music, much like my daughter is right now. Uh, for example, uh, she's, uh, she's only 19 months, and she's constantly singing all kinds of different songs. Uh, one of the things she loves to do is she'll say, uh, Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan, and she wants to hear the new Bob Dylan album. <laughs> And uh, that's the kind of kid I was. And I liked, uh, I liked music from the very beginning because music was played constantly in my house, you know, like uh, jazz mainly and, and great singers like Billie Holiday and, and Ella Fitzgerald and, and uh, you know, Dinah Washington, Sarah Vaughan, uh, just brilliant singers, Nat King Cole, even Frank Sinatra, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the music that I heard and I wanted to really, you know, early on was interested in being a singer that early and uh, uh, would sing in school, in various school things. But I never never saw it as a thing that, that I, I thought I could do, you know, for some reason. I, I took some piano lessons when I was young as well. Uh, it wasn't until I, I uh, came out of uh, uh, school and everything that I really said, hey, this is not, this academic world is not really what I'm interested in, and I, I I feel like when I made a decision to really be a musician, I was really going right back to that time as a kid. Right. Do you ever stop and ponder how your life would have would have turned out had you stayed with that? Yeah. Well, it's very interesting. From time to time, I do. You know, when you have your frustrations, you say, "Well, should I have been doing this, or should I be doing this?" And, yeah. and uh, you know, I studied in Florence. And uh, I had that, uh, that incredible opportunity to, to be there at a great time, and I was very young, and uh, and uh, and it was it just made a major impression upon me, uh, and I probably would have gone back to Florence and done some work there. You know, I would have probably wanted to work in a couple of museums, that type of thing. In your your early days, music wise, you you were playing solo a fair bit around New York. Um, tell us a bit about those days. Were you doing mainly your own material at that stage? I always did my own material. Occasionally I'd do a couple of songs, you know, other other people's songs, you know, in a set, you know. But uh, my performing, uh, uh, sort of just before I became, say, a, a professional musician, musician, if you want to call it, you know, performing in the 60s and being and living in the 60s was just an incredible period of time to be alive. Uh, uh, the 70s, the 80s, and now the 90s don't even come remotely close to that period. It was very, very exciting, and uh, 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 life wasn't so expensive, and, and people were freer in, in so, many, so many ways. It was a sexual revolution. It was, uh, it was certainly a, it was a civil rights revolution, uh, Vietnam. I mean, it was an incredible, incredible atmosphere, and uh, uh, a lot of bands were performing, and of course you had the Beatles, Stones, Dylan, uh, Bray Charles, uh, James Brown, you know, all these incredible, incredible Motown, incredible influences. And I started at that time, really. Um, I played with people like Lou Reed, and, and uh, that I had my own bands uh, with uh, some musicians, uh, unknown musicians. Uh, and I was writing songs for those bands, and then eventually I made a decision to to really start playing as a solo performer, uh, and, and that really really connected me to my songwriting and to the direction that I still, in a way, am in today. Right. One of those early bands was Grinder Switch. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was a band that was uh, uh, put together with uh, a bunch of people that uh, originally... Uh, some of which uh, played with the band, uh, uh, you know, the band as in Robbie Robertson's band. Right, yeah. And uh, Stan Celeste, the piano player, was one of the forerunners of the band and uh, uh, really, you know, started with uh, Ronnie Hawkins. And uh, so we, we formed this band that was very influenced by the band. And uh, this was in the 60s, the late 60s. 
uh, we were up in uh, Woodstock area, same area, uh, rehearsing and uh, performing, and eventually we made our first album, and and it didn't, it, you know, it didn't last very long. But that was my first record, first recording experience. I've always gotten the impression over the years that you're an artist that uh, critics have trouble uh, trying to pigeonhole into into a particular musical style. Does that bother you when they when they try to? Well, it's it's you know I've been in the business for a long time. You know I've been making music for a long time, and uh, I, there are a lot of things about this uh, this this business as such uh, that I don't like, and I think most musicians don't like. Um, I, I'm really in the in the world of making music. That's what I, I you know I, I fell in love with music from very beginning, as I mentioned to you, and when I started to really do it like in the public and, and, and uh, making records. and It was really a love of, of being involved in music and, and being involved with singing and, and working with other musicians and the fun of it all. And, you know, and regar- you know regarding a, a, a style that you should be in, or, you know, the, all, all that to me is just a bunch of hogwash. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, to me it's just ridiculous. And uh, the people that run the business, so to speak, the... the the entrepreneurs, the, the corporate conglomerates now, and, and these kinds, they're not really into music. They don't know about music. You know, they know about, you know, they're interested in marketing and selling records and, uh, and imaging people in, in China, like narrow, have a narrow focus so they think they can sell the records best that way and all this kind of garbage. Yeah. And I've always also got the impression that the things you've just mentioned, they obviously matter a lot more to you that than the commercial success that could come with music. Well, I, I, everybody wants commercial success. And everybody wants financial success, and I'm certainly one of those people. Um, but I was never interested in compromising myself to get to that place. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, I think that when you can do something creative and, and exciting and have financial success, that's the best of that's the best, you know. And I'm just not that kind of writer. I've never been that kind of writer to, to make those kind of songs and stuff. I, I, I don't really put that down. But uh, what I find is the, especially today, the atmosphere of music, uh, the atmosphere of the music business is is very wanting. Just going over your, your back catalogue, the number of albums you've released in in comparison to the number of years you've been around, it probably averages out to an album every every two years or so. Are you happy with that, right? Well, if I can continue doing, say, an album every two years, that's fine with me. Yeah, you happy I with mean, that? Uh, sure. I mean, um, uh, I mean, I, I remember at one point I made six albums, uh, six albums in seven years. That's pretty. That's pretty rough. It's churning them out. Yeah. Yeah, you're churning them out. You maybe you're in that kind of an energy, you know. But I don't really, I don't really want to sustain that kind of a. Energy. I'm, I'm more interested in uh, having an idea, having a world that I want to write about. You know, being in touch with a particular part of my life, or being attracted to a certain kind of wor- a certain kind of um, you know something part- something that really really stimulates me. Going after that uh, that concept, uh, writing about it, researching about it, finding out where I fit in it. You know, locating my own my own muse within this particular area, you know, say like the Buckwheat album, uh, you know, or, or even this new album, Wildlife Dictionary, you know, you know, finding out where I am in these things and exploring that and trying to put these, this, my personality into uh, my life, into the songs, you know, and, uh, and, you know, if I, if it takes two or three years to do this and, and I come up with something I really like and I'm happy with, that's, that's really where it's at for me. Would um, your method of songwriting and your, the way you approach it has that you varied much over the years? Have you, you changed your approach much over the years? It changes. It really has changed. Yeah. And and uh, and and, uh, and I expect it to continue to change. Um, uh, lately, I've been doing a little bit of writing with other people. That's been a, f- a freeing situation because it doesn't necessarily have to. Uh, you know, when you've been writing your own songs for so many years. And then you get a chance to learn how to write with someone else. It's it's just a it's just an opportunity to to explore another way of doing something. You know. Yeah. Do you carry and, songs uh, around with you for a while before you put them down? 
Oh, yes, I do. I carry pieces of songs. I carry ideas. I carry themes. I carry titles. Um, uh, I carry a, a particular concept that I'm trying to explore. And uh, that's, that's, part of the, that's part of sort of the woodshedding of it and preparing. I, I, a friend of mine is um, Alice Walker. You, you, you know her. She's the writer. Yeah, uh, she wrote Color Purple and stuff. I guess you oh, know her. Oh, sure, yeah. She's a dear friend, and she's a, and she said to me something very interesting. She said that when she sits down to write a book, she's already really written it and thought it out in her mind. And what she does is sit down and write the whole book, pen pen to paper, no computer, or, you know, just straight down on paper. And I think when a time when a time comes for me to write songs, when I actually get into the writing of a song to sort of put together an album. I've already really gone through uh, where I'm where I'm headed with this album. Right. So it doesn't always work that way, although. When you are getting a song down and getting lyrics down in particular, do you usually find that you've, you've gone with your first draft or do you, you tinker around with them a bit? It really depends. It really depends. Like on the new album, the track Sexuality, uh, a particular a particular song that I like very much. Uh, I feel it's uh, it's uh, it's a departure for me in subject and and in, I, I like the spirit of that song very much. That came right out, mm -hmm. bang, one one roll. Uh, lyrics came right out and it was really magic for me. And and that so the the idea is you know sometimes when something comes out that easy. You, you question it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but it, this was, yeah, this was very obvious, and and I was able to really say, yeah, that that's it. Are you, would you call yourself a harsh judge of your own work? Uh, not a harsh judge, uh -huh. uh, but I, but I become uh, I've become more more uh, disciplined mm -hmm. for this way, yeah. less less indulgent. Something interesting about being self indulgent. It's 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 a plus and a minus. Sometimes being self-indulgent allows you to be very spontaneous because you just pour it out. You know, if you believe everything you write is brilliant, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you pour it out. Uh, and the other side of it is that it can be, you know, beyond, beyond really its, it's real, it's real uh, strength, you know. So yeah. I, I think I've become a better writer. Fair enough. Let's talk a little bit about the, the most recent album. Um, we haven't had release of it down here in Australia as yet. Do you know if that's likely to happen? I really don't know. I, I really can't say. Um, uh, I'm not that in control of that. You know, I mean, where for me, I, I, I just really give them the records and uh, then they go and run with it. Yeah. You know, uh, I know that, uh, for example, um, Armani, the uh, the uh, designer is using one of the songs, a sexuality track, for perfume. Oh yeah, a, a perfume product that he's releasing in uh, in the springtime, April April sometime. I think he's doing it in Europe first, UK and uh, and France and Italy, Germany. You know, in general, yep. in Europe, and then he's going to move it around the world. And that's a good thing for me because what that does. Is uh, the song is in the is in the uh, commercial, so it exposes the song, and uh, perhaps it'll it'll help to release the album in places that it's not released right sure. now. It'd be a springboard, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the idea. And now, I believe you didn't have a, a set band working with you on the album. You went with various players in, in various places as well. Um, for you, what advantages did that bring to the recording? It's just you know. Um, it for me, it's it's uh, it provides uh, a, a stimulation, an inspiration, and uh, just a different kind of experience. You know, it's um, um, I think that everybody's doing that today. You know, uh, in other words, they they record in New Orleans, and then uh, the next album they're doing in Argentina. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, what I mean to say is that I like the idea of uh, mixing up the approaches. Uh, I, I think I think that uh, stimulates you, challenges you, yeah. and especially working with different musicians. I've always done that throughout my career. Uh, occasionally, uh, the same musician appears on different records, you know. 
but uh, I like uh, recording in Jamaica. I like going to London. I, you know, I like now. I might be doing some stuff in Spain, and I do like all that. It gives me a chance to experience different culture, different world, different different way of working with people, and, and so forth. I read also that uh, you didn't have a lot of the songs ready at the time of recording. Yeah, yeah this particular record, uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to do for it. And uh, Sexuality was the first song for it, and that really indicated to me a very strong indication about how I was going to, I mean, the direction uh, of the record. Mm -hmm. so I guess a lot of the songs more or less uh, developed themselves in, in the studio, did they? Like well, a lot of the songs, uh, I, I, would, I would write them, uh, and then, uh, or co-write them, uh, and then record them. Uh, in certain cases, I would, uh, work in people's home studios and, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, singing a vocal in a, in a little, uh, room that was like, it was hardly, could hardly stand up because there was so much junk around. We were really just trying to get like a rough vocal, but turned out to be the master of the, of the uh, 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 master vocal for the track, you know. Yeah. And some of that kind of approach took place, and that was good. I enjoyed that. You wish sometimes you could go back and, and approach some of your past albums in that way? Uh, not really. I mean, you know, I mean, I think that, I think that you always can look at certain things in your records and say, well, I, I wish that I had done a better album here, or I wish that, uh, you know, but, you know, you can't really look back at this kind of stuff. You know, you progress. Technology is different. Yeah. Uh, approaches are different. You didn't really have home studios years ago, you know, and you're looking for a certain sound, a certain studio sound, you know. And uh, ultimately, I like being in the studio. It's, it's, uh, it gives me a chance. I, I, I'm just uh, I'm, I'm away from the world, and I, like, I, I can really focus on the creative process. The uh, recording process still is as exciting for you today as say, you know, 25 years ago. Yeah, I, I would say it is. Once I once I'm sort of underway and I know where I'm headed, you know, in the sense of uh, the kind of record I want to make, you know, uh, then I'm as nervous as I as I as I ever as I ever am. <laughs> you know, I'm apprehensive. I'm I'm uh, I'm uh, nervous. Uh, I'm uh, and then uh, then as it as it unfolds, then it becomes exciting. You you know, you you get to hear the songs with the band uh, in full bloom, you know, and uh, so, I, so I like that. A lot of the songs on the album are, are made up of uh, experiences, past experiences, past relationships, looking back. Is that right? Yeah. How did you find that experience, um, going back over your life like that and, and putting it all down? Well, this particular record, you know, has something to do with my my past as well as my present. I mean, uh, I think that as a songwriter, uh, if you look across my records over the years, that's what I'm always doing. I'm always sort of writing writing a record in the present, always using the past as a reference, uh, always comparing the present to the past, um, and. Uh, and choosing different ways to do that, like different subject matter. You know, in this case, it's more about sex and sexuality and, and uh, you know, real, real love, real, real emotion connected to, uh, you know, another person, you know, uh, having a relationships with people. Sometimes the, uh, the feelings of uh, disappointment, the feelings of, uh, of taking another person for granted, um, you know, fidelity issues, um, uh, issues of, uh, of, of really in intimacy, in learning about intimacy, uh, uh, learning how to reveal yourself, uh, you know, being, uh, being able to make amends to your partner, you know, uh, and, and seeing that, you know, when you were younger, you really didn't have those kind of uh, abilities, you know, it was, uh, and as you're an older person, as you're a more mature person, you know, you value a relationship you value love you know i've been with my wife for almost almost uh, 17 years now and uh it's a long time to be with somebody there must be some reason for it yeah you know? and um so you know like all relationships that are long lasting it is truly a journey it is truly a uh, a um 
you know, and you know, in, in keeping with the title uh, of the album, you know, you have, in a sense, you develop a vocabulary. You know, you develop a a, a, a way of communicating. You know, the the uh, the title songs, you know, uh, sexuality, temptation, lust. You know, these are all words we've all we all know about. But each and every one of us out here in the world, you know, in Australia, you know, in America, and, and in the UK, and, and and Europe, all over the world, we have our own definitions, truly, of what these words mean for us. You know, this 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 heterosexuality, homosexuality. This there's, uh, you know, uh, the meaning of, of real intimacy is different for people. You know, some people can't really have an um, intimate relationships. Some people are, are not capable of having it. They're very, very, uh, you know, they're afraid. They're, 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 they're really locked up in a certain way, you know. Um, so I guess what I'm, I'm really exploring these, the meaning of these words for me and the meaning of, of really what it takes to uh, to get to this place, and one of the great people that I I, I never worked with before was uh, Pino Palladino on bass, and uh, and uh, Steve Jordan, who's worked with me on previous records. Uh, Steve and Pino were friends. Steve brought Pino in. He came in from London. We worked in New York, and he put the bass down on most of the tracks. Uh, Steve Jordan is a is a dear friend of mine. Uh, uh, he he played uh, drums and and added a certain kind of percussion and additional kind of analog uh, uh, drums to the album that just give it a very special quality. Steve is to me one of my favorite people and a great great drummer. Um, Bashiri Johnson on percussion, Jeff Bova who is a really talented synthesist, and uh, 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 Richard Rigo who's a, a Brooklyn guitar player that doesn't mean he's a bad guy but uh, he, he he's uh, he's new on the scene and he's a very very talented musician um tony Sadress, who was uh played with paul simon and a south african accordion player very very good um we worked with uh Waya lindo from the whalers played on uh when we went to jamaica robbie lynn um Simpleton, uh, one of the DJs from Jamaica, Gitsy Willis, a guitarist. These are some of the players. It's really, really wonderful, wonderful players. Wonderful and diverse too. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, from from you know, the, I mean, the list is long. I'm just giving you a few of them. And uh, um, Ben Barson, uh, Ben Barson being the brother of um, uh, the guy, uh, the guys from uh, Madness. Oh yeah, and uh, Albert Castro on trumpet, Sly Dunbar from uh, Jamaica. He's he's one of my favorite people. Fantastic musician, and like that. Just going back a bit, there's a there's a period of time there, a lengthy period of time in the eighties where you didn't record. Uh, did you? Were you still writing at that stage, even though you weren't uh, actually getting anything down? Yes, I, I was. I was writing. I mean, this was the period I was talking about before. I had recorded from 70, 76, 77, 78, 79, right up until 83. I made seven, six albums in seven years. Yeah. And I think I just reached the point of uh, um, I, I, I met my wife around this time. Um, and I, I think I reached the point where I had accomplished a great deal. I had done a lot of touring. It, for me, it was like album, tour, songwriting, album, tour, song. And when you're living on your own, you're living by yourself. You know, you can really do that. Yeah. You know, you're you're all alone, and you're working. You know, and, and you're living a life of a, of a of a rock and roll musician, so to speak. And uh, I think I got tired of that, and I wanted to regroup and and really make some other decisions. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and at the same time. Uh, the, the music was changing in the 80s. Uh, technology was changing. And uh, while I'm, I'm not a, uh, uh, a big fan of the whole digital world, uh, I'm really not that keen on it. I'm not that keen on the sound. I prefer vinyl rather than, than the CD. I had to really acquaint myself with that. You know? So I spent a lot of that period of time from, say, 84 until, say, 89, 
uh, woodshedding, writing, taking a break, uh, reevaluating, and then I made the, the Buckwheat album. I started really making the Buckwheat album earlier than that, uh, you know, little pieces here. and uh, I wanted to really make something very, very special, and that's a record that I'm very proud of. How, is, uh, how would you say your, your relationship with, with record companies has been over the years? Well, it's, it's um, yeah, well, you know, record companies, you know, they have their style and they have their way of marketing you, you know. When you're a very big artist, when you're a big selling artist and a big artist, you don't have a lot to do with a record company. And what I mean by that is that you that people make these deals like a U2, for example. They'll make a deal where they deliver their record. You give me the money, I'll deliver the album, the video, the uh, the uh, the cover, and all that. They have nothing to do with it. And what they do is then go out and sell it, the record company, you know. And uh, that's when you're in that kind of position. Uh, what I don't care for often in a record company, and I, and I emphasize further these days, is that they really don't know what they're doing. They're not leaders, they're followers. And, and often they, they clone, they try to clone what's, what's popular, you know. And uh, what's a sad thing in the, in the industry right now is that the companies have become much more of a, a distri distribution arm rather than uh, a real record company like in the, in the, in the late, in the early 70s where you had the great Warner Brothers people, Lenny Warnaker, Ted Templeton, uh, you know, these kinds of, these kinds of guys uh, who were hands-on A&R people who also produced records, you know. Um, so I miss that kind of uh, atmosphere uh, that was more creative. Yeah. Uh, performing live, are you doing a lot of that these days? No, I'm not performing at the moment. Uh, but I intend to. Right, okay. And when you do, any chance that we might be fortunate enough to catch you down here? I really wish I could. I, it, it, to be honest with you, it doesn't seem likely. You know, yeah. I, I haven't gotten there. I haven't gotten there as yet. And uh, there've been possibilities. I was supposed to uh, uh, do a tour at one point with the Black Sorrows. We were going to do a tour together. Oh, and uh, and uh, Joe, Joe. Uh, I like Joe. He's a friend of mine, and uh, he's he's a very nice person, decent person. And um, so we had planned to do that, but that didn't really come about, you know, for oh. you know, always the different reasons. What a shame! That, that's a possibility. I mean, I may come back and do that. May come come there and do something with Joe, you know. Oh, you'd be most welcome. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, thank you. What are you listening to at home these days in the way of music? Listen to a lot. Uh, well, I'm listening to the Dylan album a lot right now. It's wonderful, and, isn't it? I love the record. Yeah. You know, and, uh, but I listen to everything, you know. I mean, um, I'm listening to Betty Carter, listening to John Coltrane at the moment, you know. I mean, I have a collection of CDs, and so I listen to Bob Marley. I listen to Elvis Costello. I'm listening to movie soundtracks, Cinema Paradiso, and... Uh, you know, I mean, I'm in touch with what's going on at the moment. You know, I, I don't particularly care for it that much. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there are a few this is and that's. You know, uh, but I, you know, I, I you know, I recently read an interview with Dylan. Maybe you've gotten something about that interview down there, where he said he didn't really hear much uh, going on. You know, and uh, and I and I also saw uh, a Van Morrison show. Uh, not a Van Morrison show, but a, a TV show on Van Morrison. He said the same thing. Yeah, yeah, I did say and that. I said, well, that, that's, I said, that's the way I feel. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, don't, I really don't hear much going on. I, it's hard for me to relate to the Spice Girls and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, I, I don't find that really... Uh, that's a product to me that goes... You know, it's not music. It's not real. You know, you know my music, so you know that I'm interested in uh, an emotional experience, uh, a deep, uh, a deeper kind of view on life, you know, and not a I'm marketing just, exercise. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, I mean, uh, you know, it's um, money is, is is okay, but it's not not that it's not that important. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? To me, to me, uh, I'm interested in a different kind of life. Sure. Okay, Galen. Look, I won't hold you up too much longer. 
just to wind up, any regrets at all? Anything you'd, if you had the chance, you'd like to go back and change? Let me see. Um, I, I guess the only regret I have, uh, or one of the one of the things that that concerned me is, I, I I had hoped, wished that I'd had a real good manager along the way, because um, they're very difficult to come by. Uh, they, I find uh, that uh, that that's the weakest link in the industry. Uh, people who are really sincerely interested in uh, <clears throat> not just furthering the career of an artist, but they're involved in the in in, in really representing the artist in a, in a responsible way. You know. Yeah. And uh, I find that that's been a difficult thing for me because often I have to take on some of those kinds of responsibilities that distract me from having the focus I really want and need for my work. Right. Fair enough to... So that's, that kind of tells that story. Okay. All right. Well, thank you uh, once again for your time this morning, Galen. Thank you for many years of wonderful music and hopefully many more to come. Okay. I, I just would like to say that uh, to the audience out there that uh, I want to thank all the fans and uh, that supported me over the years. I, I, uh, I've gotten many letters uh, through my uh, P.O. box and, uh, and now some through my, uh, uh, my Internet uh, address. Uh, and, and I really appreciate this communication, support, and uh, uh, keep on keeping on. We'll surely do, and we'll be here waiting for you whenever you do make the trip down. Thank you so much. Okay, all the best. Thank you, John. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.